All right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joe Joseph Coleman. I am the host for the Rappahannock Community College voting information section uh, for our students and members of the local community. I am joined by members of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Voting uh, Subcommittee. They are uh, Ms. Karen Turner, Ms. Beth Robinson, uh, Ms. Jill Quinlan, and uh, Ms. Abby Parsons. Uh, I've already covered some of the housekeeping rules uh, uh, for this afternoon that we please ask you to mute your uh, devices. And if you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat box and Ms. Robinson, uh, Ms. Robinson, Robbins rather, <laughs> will uh, get those questions out and, and try to uh, submit them for a speaker. Um, okay, with the, with the, with the historic uh, presidential election approaching, every eligible American voter should exercise his or her right to be heard at the ballot box. This information session will attempt to answer the questions that you need to know in order to help all eligible voters exercise their civic duty and participate in our, in our democracy. We are pleased this afternoon to have Ms. Laurie Gump, the Director of Elections for King George County. I uh, understand this is a new title for her, uh, for Ms. Gump, uh, that uh, this, this been a, she told me about a couple of days ago. Uh, Ms. Gump has held this position for 15 years. She has been a Region 3 Director for the for the uh, Voter Registrar's Association of Virginia for six years. Uh, she has been, to, been a mentor to other registrars in the area. She lives in King George County. Uh, she told, told me she likes to cook and read in her spare time, which, uh, which she, uh, with the upcoming election, I'm not sure how much that she's going to have, but uh, uh, I'm, we're so very uh, thrilled to have her that, uh, to speak to us this afternoon, to give us an overview of some of the frequently asked questions uh, uh, regarding the upcoming election. And uh, I'll now give you Ms. Gump to who will present this overview and, and to address uh, many of these questions. Uh, Ms. Gump, are you on? I am, thank you. Okay, thank you guys for having me. So um, just a couple things. First of all, I wanna go over some of the laws that were passed um, in July. Um, and one of those was the HB 235 and SB 219. And this is um, kind of coincides with one of the questions that you all sent me as to how do I register to vote? Um, this bill, uh, provides for automatic voter registration when a qualified citizen interacts with the DMV or the DMV website to get a new driver's license or ID or to renew their existing license. Um, individuals will be asked whether they are a U.S. citizen and given the option to decline to have their information sent to the Department of Elections to register them to vote or update their information. Uh, prior to the enactment of this bill, voter registration at the DMV was considered opt-in because the individual needed to confirm that they wanted their information sent for voter registration purposes. Now the DMV will ask the question in a way that requires the individual to opt out. So basically in a nutshell, what this is, is that anybody who will go to the DMV to change anything will automatically be registered to vote. Now saying that for this upcoming election, and because of the pandemic, um, a lot of people haven't been able to get appointments with the DMV. And our deadline to register those to um, uh, vote in this upcoming election is October 13th. So what we have been actually uh, instructing people to do is to go to the Department of Elections website, which is www.elections.virginiaspelledout.gov. And they can actually go online and register to vote. Um, and it comes directly to our workstation. Uh, if they're not a uh, citizen or if they're not a uh, resident of Virginia or they're moving into Virginia and can't, don't have a driver's license, then what we're asking them to do is to come into our office and we will provide an application. And I know that's going on around the, the state, um, you know, because we want to make sure that everybody gets their addresses changed and everybody gets to um, update their information and be registered to vote. One of the other laws um, 
and I know that this has been one that people have heard a lot about is um, HB19 and SB65. And that's the voter identification. Um, and basically, if you hear on the news, you hear people say, well, you don't need an ID to vote. Well, you do need an ID to vote. Um, you just don't need a photo ID. Now, with that being said, and we don't advertise this, but there is a law provision out there that basically says if you come to the polling place and you don't have an ID, that you can sign an affirmation. And if you sign that affirmation, then you will be allowed to vote. If you refuse to sign the affirmation and don't have an ID, then you will be um, allowed to vote provisionally. Um, but that's not something that we really want to advertise out there because we really want people to bring their, their ID to the polls, be it their driver's license or be it a voter registration or their student ID or anything. Um, the big law that changed for us is the um, absentee voting, HB1 and SB111. And that's the absentee voting no excuse required. Um, these bills are uh, identical and they eliminate all the excuses previously required for a voter to be eligible to vote by absentee ballot. When this bill first started, um, being talked about. It actually um, was for seven days. And then in this last General Assembly session, um, they took it from the seven days and made it the whole 45 days. So for the whole 45 days, we've always had 45 days of absentee voting. Um, and it's always started, but you've had, whenever you came into our office, you had to have an excuse. So you had to fill out an application, give us a reason as to why you weren't going to be at the polls, and then you were allowed to vote. With this bill, it allows you to come into our office, show us your ID, we give you a ballot, and you go cast it. So there's no excuse whatsoever um, on this bill, and it's for the whole 45 days. We are probably, as far as I know, we are the only state that does 45 days no, no excuse voting. The rest of the states do probably 14, 21 days, seven days, um, but Virginia is the only one that does the 45, the 45 days. Um, the other big bill that came down from the General Assembly was absentee voting HB 238 and SB 455, and that's the deadline for returning absentee ballots. And this became effective July 1st as well. What this bill does is it changes the deadline for a voter to return an absentee ballot by mail or commercial delivery service. As long as the postmark or other indication of mailing or sending the ballot via commercial delivery service indicates that the ballot was mailed by election day, the ballot can still be counted if received by the general registrar by noon on the third day after the election. So it has to be postmarked by the election day in order for us to be able to, um, to, to count it on Friday at noon, which is good because a lot of times if we are mailing out or emailing ballots to our military or people who are overseas and we're doing that, I mean, I'm doing mine now, which the 45 days starts the 18th you know what happens then is if they're overseas sometimes we don't we might not get them back so it allows us to be able to accept those ballots um, that are postmarked for um, three days up until friday after the election um, noon okay um one of the other things i really wanted to talk to you guys about and i know you've heard this in the in the um in the media uh, and Mr. Coleman, I know you heard this because I talked about it in my last session, but what's the difference between mail voting, absentee voting, and early voting, okay? Well, mail voting is basically right now, and they may have changed it because uh, I'm not sure, but as it stood before this election, there was only five states that truly were mail ballot states. And that was Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Utah, and Hawaii. And what that was is that you actually, the, the, the residents of those states were sent a ballot, period. They didn't have to request it, they were just sent out a ballot. The difference is, is that those states have been doing it for a long time and have processes in place 
that allows them to be able to accept those ballots back. The rolls may be cleaner than some of the other states. Um, they do photo um, um, signature verifications. So states like us, which is Virginia, and a couple other states, 29 other states to be exact, do what is called absentee, where you as the voter have to actually call our offices or email us or send it through the computer to request a ballot. We're not just going to send you one out unless you call us and request it. And so when you request it, what we're doing is we are looking you up in the system to make sure, number one, you're registered where you say you live. And number two, that you basically, we're gonna ask you some questions if you're calling us. Um, if you're sending it online, we're gonna make sure that you're, you're active. We're gonna make sure that you, you know, that, that the address that we have on file is the address that you have sent it to us. And then we will send out the ballot to you. But we're not just gonna send a ballot out to you just because other states are doing that. So the difference is, is that mail voting is states that constantly are just, and they've done this for years. This is nothing new. This is not a new process because this is the presidential election. They've done it for every election. Colorado has been doing it for almost 10 years now. They have a process in place. Um, absentee voting, like I said, 29 states um, are doing that. And early voting is basically where you just come in early prior to the election. And we talked about that. Ours is 45, some states are 14, and some are seven. But you hear these things on the news. And I think Mr. Coleman and I were talking before some of you had gotten on here. And I said, if you want to know something, you need to go to the sources of your registrars, your directors of elections. And by the way, that's a, a title for all of us in the, in the um, election community. We got that title last General Assembly. <laughs> So, um, so, but because we work in it and we know, um, you know, we, we, we are in it, um, we're in the crutches of it, we know what's coming down the pike. So, you know, we're asking if you have questions, call us, email us, let us know. We will try to um, answer them the best that we can. Um, so some of the questions that was sent to me was, what is the deadline? So I'm going to give you some deadlines if you have a piece of paper. So important deadlines is um, early voting begins Friday, September 18th. So that's when all of our absentees need to be mailed out by Friday the 18th. Uh, Tuesday, October 3rd is a deadline to register or change your registration before the November election. Friday, October 23rd, 5 p.m. deadline for requesting a mail absentee ballot. I would highly suggest that if you were going to get one that you would do it prior to Friday, October 23rd, because that doesn't really give you much time to get it and get it back to us. Saturday, October 21st, 24th, excuse me, and Saturday, October 31st, um, most offices are all offices are open those days and from nine to five. Those are two Saturdays. There may be other offices. I'm not sure what areas you all live in, but there may be other offices that are going to be open more Saturdays and maybe longer hours in the evening. So you just need to check the websites of your registrar's um, pages to find out. Saturday, October 31st is the deadline for you to abs absentee or early vote period. Um, so unless there's an emergency and I will go over that here in just a minute. Some of the other things that um, had just come down the pike um, within the last week, week and a half is um, all ballots that will be mailed out will have postage paid for the ballots to be returned to us. Okay, so we're highly recommending that if people have requested a ballot that they do mail it back to us um, because the postage is paid on that for them. Um, the other thing is that every um, registrar's office uh, will have some kind of a drop box at some kind of location within their county. Our drop box will be right on our main door at the building. Um, it is handicap accessible. So I'm not sure you will check with your registrars uh, in the counties that you live in to find out where your drop box is off because some localities that are bigger like Fairfax um, 
Henrico, they may have several drop boxes in several parts of their county. Um, there'll also be drop boxes or bags um, at each of the precincts on election day that people can actually go and drop off their ballots as well. So those are a couple of the things um, I'm trying to think if there was drop boxes. Oh, um, the absentee ballots that are coming back to us. Um, we are required now to open up the outside envelope of the electoral board, look at it. If it's wrong, if there's something wrong on envelope B, we are required to get a hold of the voter and have them either come back in and um, fix it or mail them out another envelope. So um, an envelope B, basically it has the voter's name, it'll have their address, it'll have a signature, and then it'll have a witness part. The witness part was taken off for this election only, um, but they didn't take off any of the other, um, they didn't make anything else immaterial. So for example, if I have a voter who has a post office box and I've mailed it to their post office box and they've sent me back that envelope and instead of them giving me their residential address on that line where it says where their residence is and they put their post office box, I'm required to call that voter and have them come and fix that so the ballot will count okay and that was one of the ones that was in these new laws that were just sent out um, from the special session that the general assembly just met um, so we went over the deadline how do you know if you're eligible to vote in virginia um, well if you're 18 on or before november the third not a felon and are a resident of virginia and you register you're eligible to vote Okay, um, so just remember that all of you 17 year olds out there, um, if you're going to be 18 before November 3rd, you can go ahead and register and um, go ahead and get your ballot. Can you vote early? Uh, yes, we did talk about that. And the scenario for early voting is basically um, some locations will have satellite offices that won't be in the registrar's office. Some locations will have several satellite offices. Uh, because we're a smaller locality, we, we opted just to do it in our, our building. Um, can you vote by mail? Yes. Uh, voting by mail has started now. Uh, and it'll go all the way, like I said, up until October the 23rd. Um, this is what will the voting in person look like on November 3rd under the COVID-19 restrictions. So um, under the COVID-19 restrictions, I've got so much PPE stuff in my, my office right now. I'm running out of space to put it, but um, I'll just back up. In June, we, we voted um, all outside. We did a drive-through for all of my precincts. In November, I don't know that I can actually do that because we don't know what the weather's gonna be like for one thing, and it's darker in the morning and it gets darker at night. Uh, we may do, uh, we definitely will do curbside because we've always done curbside voting. And we may extend that out a little bit for those who don't want to go inside of the polling place to do curbside at certain hours. Because number one, we want to keep our people safe as far as, you know, whether it's dark outside. So we may do it from like seven to four um, and then offer curbside where my voters will come, where my people will come out and take care of the, the voters if they need to. We're still trying to work out all those details, but but for every office, and this is throughout the whole um, Commonwealth, for every office, we, we've been provided all the PPE um, um, things, I guess, uh, cleaning supplies. So what we will do is we will um, sanitize every single uh, voting booth after every voter. Uh, we've had, we have shields made up at the check-in station and at the ballot station. We have signs for six feet apart. Uh, all of my officers will wear masks. Um, unfortunately, we cannot um, make the voters um, adhere to the policy of wearing masks. Um, you know, we can offer masks to them if they, they come, come in. in. Um, our main goal is to make sure that both the voters and my workers 
are safe. Um, I have a lot of older voters or an old, older workers that work the polling place and that is a concern of ours, but um, we, we made it work in, in June for a dual primary and we'll make it work now um, in this. And I know that all of the, I can speak for all of my colleagues as well. So, um, one of the questions is, is what if I have an emergency that forces me to miss the application or voting deadlines? Do I have other options to vote? Um, there are a couple options that allow someone who has missed the deadline um, up until two o'clock on Monday. Um, you can you can vote if you have um, if there's been a death in the family or if you had been called out uh, from work like Saturday. Um, prior to like, I, I think it's like the Saturday of our last day that we're absentee voting. So if you just found out Saturday at noon that you were going to have to go out of town, then you can come in Monday um, if you're hospitalized. Um, so there are um, just basic, and they are very specific, um, that will allow you to be able to, to vote um, if you've not been in here Saturday by five o'clock. Uh, another one would be if you were moved from your polling place because an emer emergency, like for example, if I had a chief that didn't show up um, and I needed to move you out of your polling place and you weren't going to be able to vote, then um, I, I, you could vote absentee or vote in my office on Monday as well. So there, there are very specific reasons as to why you would be allowed to um, uh, vote if you had an emergency. Um, we talked about the postage. Yes, the postage will be. Uh, we talked about the witness, so not this year. The thing that concerns me the most about changing all of these is the fact that this is only a one-time thing. And so when you do this um, for the next election, people are going to automatically think that, that it's going to happen again. So, for example, we, we said no witness for absentee for, for envelope B, but if the General Assembly doesn't come back and say no witness for absentee in the November 2021 election, people are only going to remember that they didn't have the witness for the 2020 election. So it's hard to get information out there to, to people to make sure that they understand that this is just a one time, you know, this has been a special exception because of this. So please, if you're talking to people, please let them know that this is just a, a, a special exception for this 2020 election. Um, one of the questions is, why is there so much concern about the U.S. Postal Service this year? And my, my little snarkiness <laughs> was because it's in the media. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think because there's just so much concern about this election period. Um, and I, I kind of chuckle to myself when, when people say to me, you know, I'm going to, I want you to mail my ballot to me, but I want to bring it back into you. And I'm like, okay, but I'm using the same post office. So why do you want to bring it back into me if I'm using the same post office that you're going to be using? So, but that's fine. I mean, they can bring it in. It's just, it just kind of makes me chuckle a little. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I think because they're, because of the fact that there's been, there's so many, um, absentee ballots that are going to be going out. I think that's been a big concern for the post office. Uh, I got a little, I don't know if you guys got it, but I got a little thing from the post office. I don't think I brought it with me. Um, a little postcard that basically said, if you're absentee voting, here are some steps that you need to do and some guidelines and stuff. And I thought that was pretty nice from the post office. And again, one of the things is that because most of your directors of elections or registrars are pretty seasoned in what they do, they have, um, you know, they, I have a relationship with my post, my post office, my postmaster. So they know that I'm going to be bringing up about 2,000 ballots to them soon. And, you know, um, and they're ready for it. So, uh, but yeah, I, the only thing I could think is because it was in the news the most of the time. Um, can I vote in person if I requested a mail-in ballot? Um, yes, you can, but we're asking that you please don't. Um, again, because we're paying for your postage, we're asking you that, you know, and we've given you the option to do a Dropbox. Um, it just, and the reason we're saying this is because we have to account for every single ballot that comes out of this office. And so if I've mailed Mr. Coleman a ballot 
and he wants to come in and he doesn't bring his or he does bring his ballot package back into me but it's not voted and he's insisting that he votes on the machine then i have to take that ballot spoil it because i have to account for the fact that i mailed him a ballot i have to take that ballot spoil it re-enter him into my system as a in person now and let him vote another ballot. And so it's a, if you've got a long line, it's a long process um, of doing that. So we're asking that if we did mail you a ballot, number one, go ahead and vote that ballot. If you wanna bring it back to us, that's fine. Just bring it back already voted and we'll take care of it, making sure that it gets um, ran through the system on election night. That's the other thing. Um, there's a lot of misconception about the fact of what happens between, um, me mailing my ballot in an election night. So we have, I'm not sure, I think every every locality, we have 133 localities, and if I'm not mistaken, I think all 133 of us have what's called a central absentee precinct. There may be a few that don't, and they may be just little or localities, but the central absentee precinct is basically a precinct in itself. It would be just like a precinct of you going to your own precinct and voting. So for example, if you look at my totals on election night, you're gonna see that I have six precincts. I have five that people actually go to, and I have one that does nothing but processes all of my mail ballots that are coming in. And so they're processing them throughout the day. What they're doing is they are, and it's a team of four, and what they're doing is they are taking every single piece of mail that has come in, separating them by precincts, because they are still coming in by precinct 101 or 102, yeah. and so, they're running them through the machine and they're running them through the machine at the end of the night they will get tallied with those who have walked into my office and that will be the number that is called the central absentee precinct so if you're looking at the totals on the night of the election you're going to see precincts like 101 precinct 201 precinct whatever and then you're going to see precinct cap and that cap is the central absentee precinct so those told though anytime you absentee vote it is counted in virginia i can only speak for virginia i don't know about other states but in virginia if you're going to vote absentee it will be counted um, I know a lot of people will say, well, it's only counted if it's close race, or it's only counted if this, no, in Virginia, your absentee votes are counted. So just remember that, okay? Um, let's see, oh, volunteering at the polling locality. We are always looking for new blood, and um, we really, it is a process, unless you've ever worked it, it's a process that um, it, it's memorable. It really is. I started out, I worked in the polling place first and then I decided that I liked it and I you know, went on to work in the office and stuff. But um, y you know, it's a whole total different seeing the back end of what goes on because most people don't understand all of the the um, security and all of the paperwork and all of the stuff that you have to do in order to keep the um, election secure and we have got a tremendous team here and i know that my colleagues are probably looking for other people to work so if you are or you know some young people that really want to get the experience of of um of seeing how that back end works because you're there from 4.30 in the morning until sometimes 9, 10 o'clock at night. And it's a long day, it's a long day, but it is a rewarding day because you can see, you know, the process of how um, you're checking people in, the process of when the machines close at night, um, for this election, of course, there are going to be some write-ins, so you're going to see what that process is and everything. So it, it's really, um, everybody should at least do it once. Um, you don't register, a question here, you do not register by political party. In the state of Virginia, um, you register, you just register, we don't ask you your political party. The only time that you have to declare and not even declare, but the only time that you have to tell us which primary you want to vote in is if we're having a dual primary. Like in June, we had a um, Republican con 
uh, Republican Senate and a congressional Democrat race. And it's they were both held on the same day. So if you wanted to vote, you had to tell us which ballot you wanted to, to vote in, whether it was then the Democrat or the Republican. That's the only time that you ever have to say what particular party that you are voting in. Um, you don't register by party in the state of Virginia. I know that there's been several times that there's been a law that has gone, um, that they have placed, that they have been trying to make that, and it's always been voted down. Um, here's another one. I've been convicted of a felony. Can I vote? Unless your rights have been restored, no, you can't. Um, and Governor, former Governor McCullough, had made it very easy for those who had been convicted of a felon to be able to get their rights restored. Um, for those, again, that are taking notes and you may know someone, uh, if you go to the Commonwealth, um, the Secretary of the Commonwealth's website, there is a, um, a uh, link on there that will say uh, restoration of rights or restore my rights or something like that. So as long as they have served their time and their probation period and everything is over, they can literally go in, put their information into that website. Um, and I'm not sure how long the process is now, um, but um, it's a very short process. When I first started way back when, it was like a five page, six page process that people who wanted to get their rights restored and I would sit down with them and we would go through it and they had to have like three references and they had to write a letter to the governor and they had to do all of this. So now they've made it so much more easier for those and they can actually just go on this uh, Secretary of the Commonwealth's website and um, see if they can put that in there. Um, so where do you go on election day? Um, again, check your, your registrar's website and see if their polling places are open. Um, with, with COVID, um, it's made it a little difficult for the directors, for my colleagues. We're very fortunate here in King George that we do all of our voting in the schools, um, and that we're kind of grandfathered in there, but there are some localities where they, in June, they, they, they weren't allowed to even go to um, open up the polling places. And that makes it difficult when you are trying to run an election and trying to go and find a place to, to run the election. Uh, it also makes it difficult when you get in the 11th hour, um, people who are calling and saying, I'm not working, I don't wanna work. Um, and you're trying to scurry around to find people. Um, I get I get very passionate and I get very protective. I'm like a mother bear with uh, you know all of my colleagues and 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 I hear this and and it's colleagues even across the country. I heard a story about what happened in Georgia in one of the primaries and and I'm I'm saying please if you don't understand you I I literally wanted to call the news station that I heard this and and tell them you need to talk to the people who are in the trenches doing this because it was right when the pandemic happened and they were saying they had these long lines and these people didn't, you know, their officers of election didn't know what they were doing. Well, in the state of Virginia, if we don't have enough officers of election, I can pull you off the street and make you an officer of election. Now, how much training did you have? A minute, you know? And so you don't hear those kind of things. Um, you don't hear that. All you hear is the negative of, you know, there was long lines and these people didn't know what they were doing and stuff. Well, maybe they didn't because they were pulled off the street at that point of time. So my, my thing is just be, be, be compassionate with these people who are out there volunteering basically to, to make it worth your, you know, to make it happen for you all to come out to vote um, and, and to understand that, you know, there's laws and there's things that we have to abide by. And if, if they get taken away from us, like our polling places get taken away from us and our officers of elections decide not to work, we're scurrying around trying to find these things um, and, and do these things to make the election happen. Um, so anyways, that's just my little plug for my, my colleagues there, you know, so. Um, so one of the things, what, what are the acceptable forms of identification on election day? Well, it's the same thing. I mean, you know, 
now, because we don't really require that you have a photo ID, most people are still going to bring their driver's license. Uh, but your driver's license, your voter ID, um, you know, the voter registration, any um, valid photo ID issued by an employer, uh, U.S. government, a student ID, um, U.S. military, nursing home ID, things that aren't are your out-of-state driver's license, a credit card displaying a photograph, um, your BJ's or Costco card, you can't use that, or a business card displaying that. So, you know, basically, you, you know, those are the kind. Um, what if I've moved since the last time I voted? Depending upon when you moved and where you moved, you may be able to still go back to your same precinct and vote. Um, so there are, again, laws that uh, there's like time time periods and all of the chiefs and election officials at the polling places have the, what, what is called a what if guide. And so uh, if I moved from my home in the last election, but I forgot to update my voter registration card, but I'm not in the same precinct, you can basically go back to your same precinct. But those again are questions that when you get to the polling place, they will, they will, or they'll call, you know, if you call us, we can let you know that as well. Um, a provisional ballot. So a provisional ballot is, is, uh, is basically a ballot that you are voting for a, a, for a reason. Number one, you were sent an absentee ballot and you didn't bring it back to the polls with you. And so we're showing on the list that we already issued you a ballot. You're going to vote a provisional. The electoral board will determine the next day as to whether that vote's going to count based upon the fact uh, when they look at the report and they see that your ballot didn't come back. And so since your ballot didn't come back, then they're going to realize that oh okay he the person only voted once okay so um, and different things like I said earlier about the photo ID or, or the ID period excuse me where if you decide that you don't want to show an ID and you don't want to sign the affirmation then you'll vote a provisional now I can't guarantee that that one will count but um, a lot of people will just they just <laughs> They just want to vote a ballot. Um, they are allowed to come back to the provisional um, um, canvas the next day to see if those votes, if, if the electoral board has counted those ballots. Most of the time they do because they're mostly people who have uh, got an absentee ballot and decided that they didn't want to, they didn't want to vote that absentee ballot. So, um, or at, it used to be that we would get a lot when um, people were, when before the DMV was actually um, doing the automatic registration. And so what would happen is they'd say, well, I went to the DMV and I registered to vote and we would do research and we found, yes, they did say yes, that they registered to vote, but we never got their application. So, um, and, and it says, why am I receiving political mailings and phone calls? Um, I, I, well, I, I don't know. I guess um, basically what this is taken from is if you've uh, if you've have voted in primaries, then and these are public lists. I mean, any lists that we have are public. You know, they they're foyable. They're they're available to the public. They don't have any information that um, would be harmful to you all. It's just that if you um, are voting in any of the certain primaries then you're going to get information from whatever primary. So if you vote in both Republican and Democrat, you've just confused them all and you're going to get everything, you know, so, you know, but anyways. And then I kind of chuckled at this one because, I, I, again, my, my, um, my little snarky self was, how do I file a compliment? And I was going to, you know, and I was just going to say something, but it was really a complaint. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was going to tell you, just to give me any compliment, it doesn't really matter, but um, how do you file a complaint? There's forms on the State Board website that you can actually file um, uh, a complaint if you have one against us. We ask that you don't, but, you know, we know that some people probably will, um, but I, I 
when I read that, I was going to, I was, oh, I thought that said compliment, not complaint, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so um, basically, those were the questions. Um, I'm not sure if I covered everything, but we sure had a good time. Yes, we did. Yes. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. So, so, uh, Ms. Ms. Robbins, do we have any uh, any questions or from the chat? Yes, yes, we do have some questions. The first question: Can you explain what the electoral board is and does? Okay, so the electoral board um, for for my position, for all of our positions that are directors of elections, um, we are governed by a three board member. We are not elected, we are appointed. So the electoral board, uh, basically what they are is they are appointed by their political party chairs. Um, so whatever the governor is, is going to be what we have. So right now we have two Democrats and a Republican because we have a Democrat governor. Um, what happens is the political party chair of the counties will submit three names to the judge and the judge then will appoint the electoral board. The electoral board, if you break it down in the law book, the electoral board's duties are to basically run the elections. That's what the electoral boards do. However, um, a lot of that responsibility has gone to the directors of election. The registrar's job basically is to register and keep the roles of the voter registration clean. Um, but we work together as a team. And so they are kind of, if you want, they're my boss. Um, they appoint me every four years. Um, and, and I've had my board, hmm, one member has been with me for almost 10 years. And then um, the other member has been with me for six and the other one has been with me for eight. So, so they get um, reappointed every three years. They do. Okay. Thank you. We have another question. What is the deadline for reporting and updating your new address after you move in order to be able to vote in the area you live in? October 13th is the deadline for, for any registration. Okay. Um, we have another question. What education background do you need to be a registrar? <laughs> Besides a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. uh, honestly, there there is um, there is no college. Well, I, I mean, a lot of that is going to depend. Again, I don't know what happened to my. But anyways, you lost me. But um, a lot of that is going to depend on um, your electoral board who's hiring you. They may want somebody who has a college education. They may want somebody who has, um, you know, education in political science. They may want somebody who has, uh, you know, an education in, um, you know, um, a law. For me, I have a, um, I have a, um, a degree in social work and business. <laughs> You know, so um, I think the social work probably helps. I'm not sure, you know, but um, so really it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a job that um, you have to be organized. You have to, you have to know that um, uh, you have to be nonpartisan, um, really. You know, the, the biggest thing is to be nonpartisan, uh, be organized, but there really isn't any kind of education, and again, uh, unless the electoral board who is going to be hiring you from that county um, puts it out in the memo that that's what they're looking for. Okay, uh, we have another question. Do you have to register to vote in an election every year? No. No, the only time um, that you are ever taken off of the rolls um, for any um, uh, voter registration records is number one, if I have mailed you something out to your home address and it comes back to me, your registration is flagged in our system, what is called a confirmation. And then the post office gets involved as well and they'll send you out something and say, hey, we've got two addresses here for you. Where do you live? If we don't hear back from you after two federal elections, then you get purged from our system. 
So it's a lengthy period of time, really, before you're actually purged out of the out of the system. But no, if you have not ever, I have people who have been on my books since the early 60s have never voted. And because I've never had to send them out anything, and they've always lived at the addresses that they have, they'll remain on my books even if they never vote. <coughs> Okay. Any more questions? Chat box? I think it's, is that it? <laughs> no, that was the last one. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Uh, any, any other questions? Oh, I found me again. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, Ms. Gova, I want to thank you for uh, uh, coming out this afternoon and, and uh, providing this great information uh, that we all can use. We plan to put this on our uh, uh, Rappahannock.edu uh, vote website so that we can share it with the folks who, who aren't able to who aren't able to attend this afternoon. Okay. I think it's some really wonderful information uh, that will help a lot of folks. And we just, I just want to thank you for your time. Thank uh, you. And I, yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh yes, go I'm, I'm, vote. Yeah, so, <laughs> yes, so, go so, vote. So I'll either see you on the uh, on the 18th for the early voting, or the probably the next day after the crowd. So all right. <laughs> you want to call me and and see if I have a crowd? <laughs> I, I think I'll take advantage of that. How many people are there? And then I'll you know take a quick drive and come up. Yeah. So, so, uh, with that, uh, I want to uh, remind everyone to uh, go out and exercise their civic duty. Uh, Go out and vote and become voices of this election. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great Thank day. you, Mr. Coleman. Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank oh, you, Mr. Coleman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right, y'all take care now. All right. All right. Bye. Thank you. Let's see if I can.